we are going to um, I'm going to release this word to you today and I pray that it ministers to you and it's God's divine restraint and so God's divine restraint amen and so sometimes when you hear the word restraint, you'd be like, that's not fun. That is, that's, I want to do whatever I want to do. But I'm here to tell you that God has a divine restraint upon us. And so we're going to break that down and let that hit your spirit. Okay. However, it needs to hit your spirit. Right. So, you know, the word goes out, it goes into the heart. And so everybody will get something different out of this word. And so. We're going to go into God's divine restraint and how to guard and keep it and be sensitive of it for your own life because it is key to spiritual authority. So if you want to walk in great authority, God has to restrain you. You have to allow the restraint of God. And then we want to kind of shift and talk about uh, the things that steal your strength that come after it. We're going to kind of talk about uh, that Delilah spirit and all that. But let's go to Genesis chapter 2. God has always had uh, restraints on us. Okay. And so in verse uh, 15, you know, after the creation of man, and then it, and we're going to fast forward all of that. We use that in Genesis uh, 126. We talk about that a lot about the book of Genesis and God's original plan from the beginning for us. Okay. A lot of things came in and aspired, sin came and all of that. And, and so man fell, but God, you know, takes us back to the garden, back to his original intent. But the latter glory shall be greater than the past. How awesome is that? But I want to go fast forward into 15. Because it said, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Shall, you shall not eat for the day that you eat, it, you will surely die. Then, okay, so let's go. There's going to stop right there. That's it right there. And so God, all the way back in the beginning, God was establishing that he was the ultimate authority. So if we back up, we know that God created man in his own image. In his likeness, he created them, right? So in his image means like as God. And so the world being full of chaos and confusion, darkness, we know that uh, we believe in here that that's when, um, you know, Satan was uh, felt, Lucifer came down, he lost his glory, everything changes, okay? And we know there are scriptures that uh, show us that creation, God said, let us, uh, let us bring some restoration here. Okay, let us, God's going to create this human being, this man, right? It, like as him, and he created this garden, he planted the garden and he puts them in there. And they were to cultivate it, they were to tend to it, they were to make the, make the rest of the earth look like that in God's presence. And so... Um, God is the ultimate authority, and you'll never understand as a people natural or spiritual authority without looking to God himself. And so God's favored title to us is Abba. Amen. We love that, right? Abba. Abba. And so God, Abba, his name means the source of everything. Okay, so Abba is our source of everything. He is our provider. He is our sustainer. He is our foundation. Okay, so God is a source of all authority. Okay, in heaven and earth. He is a sustainer of it and the provider of it. Okay, so when you're crying out and it's all about his purpose, nothing God did does is coincidence. It's all about purpose. So when we really know him as Abba, and we begin to cry out, Abba, Daddy, Papa, whatever you, but it's Abba and it means provision. It, you don't even have to say, Lord, I need. Come on now. You don't even have to beg him. You just say, Abba. 
like from the depths of you. And when you say it, whatever you need, he is it because he hears the hearts of his children, right? Sometimes we think we got to try and articulate and don't get me wrong. We teach about decrees and all that stuff and declaring, but there's times in life. It's just, ah, bah, that's it. That's all I can say. I can't think of anything else. You're just in a place, but you need to begin to cry out to him, sustainer, provider, keeper, my source of everything. I think I'm going to lose my mind today. Abba! You get it back. I'm serious here. Y'all, maybe I'm the only one that does it, but I'm just telling you it's real. It is real. It's power. Okay. So know him as Abba. So, you know, God being the source. So this word restraint means in the Hebrew, it means a star. It means forbearance. It means holding. It means to suppress. Mm -hmm. It means to rein in. It means to check. It means self-control. And it means temperance. Okay. So God puts these this restraint on the first man. Remember, he tells them, you can eat from every tree, but not that one, right? So that's right. He knows. Come on now. He can teach. Good job. Praise God. He's listening. See, he just, he's getting it. Yes, out of the mouth of babes. He said, don't eat from that tree. And so God's goodness was all around them because he gave them everything. And then he releases authority and he says, you are going to do what I did. You're going to multiply, you're going to subdue. He says, I want you to create. I want you to increase in the earth. Okay. Tend to this, till it, uh, multiply the garden. And so in John 19, 10, 11, it says you would have Jesus speaking when they came after him and they were he was on trial. He said, you would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. Okay, that's good news to know that because we're in Christ. We're children of the God. So when things happen to us, you know, when, when we go through something, I know that I am in him. And if God allowed me, if Abba allowed me to endure something, okay, it is because he's bringing out a revelation of Jesus to me. And so you have to look at your circumstance like that. So Jesus says, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have anything. And so don't be boasting. He's like, I could, I have the power to do this and that. He said, mm, only because Abba gave it to you. He said, otherwise, he said, for this reason, the sin and the guilt of the one who has handed me over to you is greater than your own. And so we need to understand this ultimate authority that is the foundation of our life. You know, the vision that we had during worship about the robe, you know, and about it just covering us. And Jesus was walking. He was a concern. He knew where we were. He knew what was going on. There was nothing to move Christ at all. And so it is impossible to have authority or um, authority without this restraining power. You have to be under authority to have it. Now, I think about that tree, right? Because in my mind, why would you even plant a tree like that in our carnal thinking? I mean, they really didn't need it. You gave them everything, okay? But he, he plants this and he says, don't touch it or you will die, okay? And so... All authority requires a restraining principle. Okay, so let it sink in. All authority requires a restraining principle. Authority has instructions and in them is restraints. Just because he gives us authority doesn't mean we can do whatever we want with it because he is the author of it. You understand? And so... And so when God took Adam, he wanted Adam to know. And in the beginning, it was Adam, male and female Adam. Come on. And so when he did that, he was saying to them, I am your source, Adam. I've delegated all this to you, but I am your source. Okay. I am it. And so he puts him in the garden to tend and to keep it. 
but then he tells him, don't eat it or you will die. But it was to keep Adam under authority. You understand? It's so powerful to be under authority. And so when you're young and you're coming up sometimes, we still have some of that, you know, carnal rebellion in us, right? We want to do whatever we want to do when we want to do it because we know everything, right? Maybe I was the only only young person and, uh, and on up that knew everything, right? So we knew everything. So we didn't need no authority to tell us what to do because we were all knowing, okay? And it got us in a lot of trouble, didn't it? It got us in a lot of trouble. So, but when authority is delegated, it is legal authority. So when God delegates you authority, it is legal and he gives you permission to use it, right? And so I love it because Christ said, I only do what my father does, right? If I see my father do it, I will do it. And so all throughout, you will see the life of Christ where here comes, you know, Satan. Here comes, you know, even the disciples and then the religious people. Everybody was trying to get Jesus to come out from under the authority of his father. Everywhere. They were trying to get him to do it by temptations, by tests, by all kinds of things. They were pulling on him every direction. His friends, okay? And that's how, yeah, they were pulling on Christ. But Christ says, uh-uh, you don't, you don't know. You don't know me like that. I only do what my Father does. You can't pull me this way. You can't pull me that way. Your flattery won't work. Your demands won't work. The pressure won't, the temptations are not enough. It's not going to move who I am in him, in my father. So we need to look at that in our life, right? So what restraining order is on your life? So everybody's calling their, their adversity is tailor-made for them. That should be a t-shirt. We say it all the time. But it's reality, okay? That's why our neighbor, when we go through something, okay, no one else may understand the depth of what we went through, but Abba does. And so only Abba can take what we go through and what we have endured and use it for glory. He can only do that. And so, but staying under authority, he gives us more authority. All right. And so what's sad in the church today, if you talk about authority, people tend to get a little uncomfortable. It's like when you talk about giving. You know, mammon starts talking and beepers are going off and all kinds of things are talking in the spirit when you take up an offering. It's just ridiculous, right? Because mammon has men's wrestle for authority. Okay? Because Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. He didn't say God and anything else. He said mammon. And so I, I say all that because you know, when you look at that principle, you will see that there will be a wrestling in certain areas of your life to stay under God's authority. There's there's something that we all go through in our personal lives that challenge that, right? And pride is always in the midst of that because we do want to do what we want to do and we don't want anybody telling us what we do. But it's amazing to me that we can have a secular job and we submit to that boss who doesn't even know God. Come on now. Because we get we get a paycheck. But we're in the kingdom. And we have a king. And we can't submit to the king. But if we're going to walk in levels of authority that God has called us to do. It's going to take some surrender to his authority. Whatever that looks like for you. OK, because I don't because, you know, God shows me some things, but I'm not all knowing only the Holy Ghost is. And so there's certain things in your life that God uh, obviously has been dealing with you concerning this issue or this area of your life. And so um, Romans 6, 11, 16, we won't have to go there, but write it down. So without divine restraint, people become slaves to sin. Now, the restrainer and the gatekeeper of your soul, praise God, is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, right? So we have the Holy Spirit, and we're called to be sons of God 
and led by the Spirit of God. And so if I'm led by the Spirit, Spirit of God, I'm not under the law. I'm not, I'm not you know, uh, condemned. I don't feel guilty or anything. But when I come out from under God's authority and I do my own thing, and I'm not yielded to the restraint of God, which is the Holy Spirit, okay? He restrains us. He he keeps us holy. He keeps my mouth. He keeps my tongue. He he keeps my attitudes, right? We don't want to we don't want to whatever. We don't want to listen to God. We don't want to do what God says, but the Holy Spirit will convict us of righteousness. And when I walk in righteousness, I'm yielding to the restraint of God. And the Father sees that. He sees when we allow his restraint or not. And he is very, very pleased with his children that honor him as such. Amen. And so Satan works to usurp our authority through sin, uh, through open doors where we have not allowed. Thank God we do. That's why we do cleansings every couple months, right? We want we want to keep that uh, keep under God's authority. Uh, it can be many things that can come through. It can be ignorance or rebellion, those kind of things that happen. But when authority is delegated, it is legal. Legal, but the opposite is we know there's two authorities. There's witchcraft and there's God, right? And so that illegal authority comes in through rebellion. First Samuel fifteen twenty three. Rebellion is as a sin of divination and insubordination as iniquity and idolatry. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 21 says, You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of sin. And so don't become slaves to the enemy. Okay? God is saying, you know, keep the restraint before you. You know your weakness. We all have them. And it can be in our identity. It can be trying to find, you know, uh, find some validation because we never had any. It's true. It's very really true. We could have victim mentality. We could have all kinds of things. But if we don't, if we don't get, that's why when, when the Holy Spirit was moving and the robe was here and he was saying, come under the robe. He's saying, come under my authority. Come under my protection. Come under. Everything is here. It is safe there. Because you don't have to earn your way. You don't have to please man. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be anybody but who God called you to be. And so if I don't know my identity in him, and this season is sonship, right? So if I don't learn and value and know my identity in Christ, I'm going to be looking for it somewhere. Okay, I'm going to be trying to find an identity and that will be a false one. And so if, if we don't yield to the restraint of God, we will yield to something else. OK, so the authority that God gave Adam in the garden was rooted in the ability to adhere, adhere to the restraining principle that maintains and sustains authority. Isn't that something? And so the restraining principle on your life, your obedience to Jesus, OK, that will maintain and sustain spiritual authority in your life. Because, remember he said, whoever you yield your self-service to obey, obey, you become the slave to that. So guess what? He just usurped and took your authority. You lost your seat. That's why we teach about staying seated. And that's another thing that we always, always talk about because the enemy comes to steal your seat of authority through rejection, through persecution, maybe slander, maybe, maybe family issues, something, uh, something. He will come to get you to get offended, to get you to get off your seat, to get discouraged, hope deferred, disappointment, right? All these things he will come. And if we take his bait, because you know, you have the restraint of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Holy Spirit will, will, will release self-control to you if you call on him. When someone does something evil to you, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the restraint of God that will keep you safe if you listen. The conviction will come. He's there for you. It can be, um, it can be flattery. The enemy tries to come in through pride. 
and he'll come in to flatter you. He'll come in to uh, build you up or puff you up in an area to get you to break the restraint, come out of humility, the cloak of humility that keeps us safe and go over here and, and get into pride. Okay, so there you go. And then here comes pride. And so things happen like that. So he he was telling Adam, you can do all these things, but I have to put a restraint on you so you know where your authority comes from. Come on now. And so the consequences for violating the restraining principle was the day you eat of it, you will die. That's pretty serious. Now, we know we're in the new covenant. There's grace and all that. But there's a lot of spiritual death in the church. There's a lot of things that people go through in the church that they don't have to, but they did not yield to the restraint of God. And so true spiritual authority dies or ends when divine restraint principle is broken. That's why the blood is so important. And so when I come out from under God's authority, and I know that I shouldn't have done that, been there many times growing up in Christ, right? The blood of Jesus. The blood washes me. I repent. God puts me back in right order, in right alignment as if I never sinned <laughs> with grace. And I can get back in alignment now, right? And so when I get back in the grace and the alignment of God and I've repented and I'm walking with him, the devil can't talk to me about that no more. Now, you might have to do some uh, do some spiritual warfare and speak to the accuser. But if the blood is applied, he has to shut up. OK, but do you know the blood has been applied? Are you confident that you're under authority? Are you confident that you're walking with Jesus? Right. So in confidence, I can release this authority. But if I have fear, if I have doubt, if I have identity issues, come on. That's why God heals our soul, right? If I have all those things, I'm going to struggle with exercising my rights as a child of God. Okay, and everything we do as a believer is in love. But are we convinced of who we are? Okay, that's something that you have to talk to the Lord about, but you have to know who you are in this season. Sonship. Amen. And so... Um, so, in Genesis 3, 9, when the Lord God called to the man, and this is so beautiful here. I got a revelation about this a couple weeks ago before we went to Ohio. So, when the Lord God called to the man, he says to him, this is after they, they broke restraint, right? Because they were tempted. They gave in. The devil deceived and all of that. And they fell into sin. He said, where are you? OK, so, you know, God would come down. The Lord God would come down on the cool of, cool of the day with his family and he would spend time with them. Can you imagine? He was so happy. That was his family. We're his family, too. <laughs> and he loved intimacy with his family. That's why he created them. He was going to let them fix some things that the devil had done, but he he put his glory on them and all of that. And he loved spending time with them. And he said to them, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of him, a sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And then God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten? From the tree of which I command you not to eat. Now, I want to look at these words in Hebrew here. So, when God said, where are you? This in the Hebrew. Okay, so let me back up just a minute before I get there. Now, myself growing up under, and some of you too, probably harsh authority, right? They just, that's just what was in them. They loved us, but they were kind of harsh. So, when I've always thought of this right here as anger. I'm just being honest. I mean, a year ago, anger. Yeah. Where are you? It's like, where are you? You're like, what? You thought like that? Yeah, I did. Because that's what I grew up under. Remember, authority. How do we view authority? How? And I thought, man, they messed up. God is angry. He is so angry because now they've sinned and their punishment is coming. And yes, there was some things that happened. 
but then he's in Jesus. But let's look at this word. And so he says, where are you? And that word is an expression of being grief stricken. It wasn't anger. He was grieving. He was sad. He was crying out for man. He was hurt. He was broken. What? The Holy Spirit is very sensitive. God took time to fashion this creation, to breathe life into him. It wasn't that God was angry and going to beat them down and destroy them. Okay? He was grief stricken over the guilt that caused them to separate and hide themselves from Abba. So they hid themselves from him. So he's coming down. Where are you? And you say, well, God is all knowing. But he asked the question. And he was looking in the, where are you? Well, we hid ourselves from you because we were naked. And the word naked means we were exposed, Abba. We were uncovered. We were bare. And, it, and that word also means that Adam was hiding from the presence of God. And Adam also was in agony. Wow. He was in agony. Just like the Father, just like the Lord God was in agony that there was a breach in their intimacy. You got to hear that now by the Spirit about us. Okay? So there was a breach in the intimacy that he had with his creation. That's power, isn't it? To see that God was grieving over that. And so, to me, that took a whole nother picture at that. It gave me a whole nother vision here. And I don't know if I'm the only one. I know I ministered to Prophet Bertha. Because some of us, you know, maybe y'all didn't grow up underneath any kind of authority that was angry with you. And this was a big deal here. <laughs> oh, yes. But this is a big deal. Right? And so, yes, they, they, you know, things came, curses came, and then he, but, but God even had the promise there of Jesus. He wasn't going to let him stay like that. Okay, and so in 8.1, it says, Romans 8.1 says, Therefore, there is no guilt or condemnation for those in Christ. So the blood of Jesus paid your penalty, right? He paid it. So if you think about that, so when, when God's children get born again and we're coming in and we have this relationship with God and we break the restraint or we, you know, we unrighteousness and we do these things, the grieving part is that we're breaking intimacy with Jesus. Our relationship. That's what hurts. That's what hurts God because he loves us that much. It's the relationship that the blood brings us back into right alignment and relationship. He says, you can come boldly before the, the throne of grace through the blood of Yeshua Jesus. Amen. So don't, so when things are, when you feel the breach and you feel that you did not restrain yourself in an area, don't let the devil beat and condemn the blood of Jesus, right? The blood washes me because it's not on God's end. You see that when God came, God still came down. Where are you? Where are you? I mean, he was crying out for them. Where are you? He didn't, he didn't say, okay, look down. Well, it doesn't sin, so I'm going to stay up here. No, he came looking for them. Man, that's beautiful to me. That's beautiful to me. And so we need to walk in, in higher levels of authority. We have to allow the restraint of God. See, God has to trust you with authority. Yes, you have it against your own body and in the sphere of influence and all of that. And, you know, your house and different things. You exercise that. But there's great levels of authority that God wants his ecclesia to walk in. The Bible teaches that the manifestation, that the earth groans for the manifestations of the sons of God. To be made manifest, right? So the earth is crying out for us to mature. <laughs> it's crying out that we get authority. We get keys that we begin to exercise authority in the earth. The earth is groaning, moaning for us. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? That's not, that's not a, 
a storybook, whatever. That's facts. That's what you see, all these things happening in the earth and in the land and all these storms and different things. Some things they manipulate, but some things they cannot. Some things they cannot. It's just the earth is, is groaning. And so Jesus always kept under authority of his father. Harmony. See, when I'm under authority, I'm in harmony. There's, there's a harmony. There is an, an expression. There is an aroma of Christ that comes out of a saint that is under submitted to God's authority and chooses to walk with God, chooses to bend in oneness. Amen. So a good example is if you say you're, you have a housekeeper, right? Somebody that comes and cleans your house, housekeeper, house sits, and you tell them, don't let anyone in the house while I'm out or while I'm gone. Okay, so you, the owner of the house, the housekeeper has now more authority over your home, okay, than your friends or your family. Now, you didn't tell your family that. You didn't tell your friends that. But you tell the housekeeper, don't let anyone in here until I get back. I want you to think about that. So, they got their order from the owner of the house, okay? And so you get you gave the housekeeper a restraining order. You delegated that restraint. You gave it to them a restraining order that he or she can came under. And so giving her tremendous or giving them tremendous authority over your home until you get back. That's some power right there, right? And more authority than your family, than your friends, anybody. Even your mom and them. Come on. Because, you know, they think they have all the authority in your home, but they really don't. They can usurp it and cross boundaries and break restraints, but you gave it to this person, and this person now has delegated authority because it's your house. And so with authority is always going to be power, right? Things are going to happen and move when authority speaks. And you see that principle in Matthew 8, verse 5. I love that story. Let's go to Matthew 8. That's how Jesus could speak a thing. Now, we say that a lot as children of the kingdom. Well, I can just declare a thing. It's going to happen. Okay, we're talking. Let's see what's happening. <laughs> Come on. God wants that when it's according to his will, right? The word, things like that. And so Matthew 8, 5, And Jesus entered Capernaum, and a centurion came to him, imploring him, saying, Lord, my servant is uh, lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my slave, do this and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness in that place where they were weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. So this centurion says, I am a man. That is under authority. And so apparently he had heard and he saw some things that Jesus could do. Jesus could speak a thing and it would happen. He says, look, if you just speak it, it will come to pass because you are submitted to God. You are fully surrendered to God. You don't have, a, you don't have your own voice, Jesus. Come on now. You don't have your own mind, Jesus. You have the mind of God. You understand what I'm saying? I want you, this is all the, a prophetic spiritual word to you. God's trying to take us up higher. I, Jesus, you don't have an opinion. 
you don't because you're fully surrendered to the will of your Father. Jesus didn't have an argument. And when Jesus did have an argument with God's authority, guess what he did? He went and agonized in prayer till he got himself together. Because he could have been tempted. And he was tempted in all manner, but no sin. And so when they were going to kill Jesus, come on. And they were mocking him. He says, don't you know that I can call on the Father and he can send legions of angels and wipe everyone out? Paraphrasing, that's what he said. He said, but not my will, but your will be done. And so being surrendered and having God, God's restraint on my life, it gives me the grace to follow God. It gives me the grace to go through persecution and suffering for his name. You understand? It gives me grace to be strong and to have the armor on my life. But I have to stay under authority. I have to become like the king, right? And so I think about, uh, we're going to kind of shift and go a little bit about Samson with this Delilah thing, right? And so let's go to Judges. Everybody knows, most likely know your weakness. It could be that you're insecure. Maybe you have jealousy issues. Come on, let's be honest. Maybe we don't like ourselves like we should. It's time to love yourself like Christ loves you. Come on now. Maybe we covet not the gifts but someone else's identity. There's a lot of uh, copycatting in the body of Christ. There's a lot of a lot of echoes. But God's like, you're unique. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in my image. And and all all the gifts of the Holy Spirit flow through us. Come on, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they flow through us, our assignments and everything. You have different kinds of shepherds. Come on now. Different kind of fivefold giftings because there's certain people that need a certain kind of shepherd. There's certain people <laughs> that need a certain apostle in their life or a prophet or a teacher. Come on, evangelist. Just because they have some things that are the same, they're different. Very different. Different prophets, right? According to assignments, according to who we are in Christ, whatever he wrote, whatever he destined me to do. And so this is very important. So, you know, the areas that you you struggle with right now, you know, and prayerfully, we dealt with many of those on a weekend. But we want to look at that because these places of weakness can be the area where that the, the enemy can come in, just like he did here with Samson. And steal his strength. Okay. So in Judges 13, 1, it says, The sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistine for 40 years. And so here it says, There was a man named Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and she bore no children. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now, now here's this beautiful promise, right? This prophetic word comes to this barren woman who had been mostly grieving over a child. But look what happens. Now, therefore, he said, Be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So the promise comes, but guess what? The promise comes with restraints. <laughs> so a divine restraint is given to the mother. And then there's a restraint that's given to this miracle baby here. Okay, it was all miraculous. So Samson's tragic story teaches, and we're going to walk through some of that, uh, the critical importance of respecting the restraining order or the restraining principle that God places on your life. Thank God he restores us. We know that. We're in new covenant. But these things are to teach us some things here. 
Okay, these stories, God wrote this, the, the old and the new is for uh, teaching us and for training us in righteousness. So we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So heaven opened Samson's mother's womb, but then there's a restraint put on her to protect the child and the pregnancy. What if she wouldn't have followed divine restraint? We don't know if she'd have had that baby or not. Because I want, I want you to understand, many visions don't come to pass. Many prophetic words do not come to pass because man will not yield to the restraint of God. We get in the lines. I want another word. I want a word. I want a word. I want a word. You're not restrained. And so the word's going to come, but you're not going to walk in it until you learn to the restraining principles for your own life. Okay? And guess where you get them from? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We can give you instruction, but you got to hear from God for yourself. Come on now. So there was a restraining order to protect the child in a pregnancy. No wine, no unclean food was to enter her mouth. Then a restraining order was put on the child, the miracle baby. So the restraining order was con uh, connect his ability. The restraining order was connected. I want you to hear that. To his ability to deliver the people of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. It was so important to God that he obeyed. Why? Because the source of Samson's power was Abba. He didn't just, you know, I'm just going to give him. He can do whatever he wants with his power. No. And he can get all the glory and he can just, what? no. He made a covenant. And we know he couldn't cut his hair, right? All those things. He was a Nazarite. So violation of this restraining order from Samson would strip him of supernatural power over the Philistine armies. So modern day, when we're violating God's restraint and we're not obeying God, guess what? We lose our power. We lose our authority over the power of the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's like when God says, touch not, taste not, handle not. I give you boundaries. I give you boundaries for your marriage. I give you boundaries how to live here. I give you boundaries here and boundaries there. And we're like, eh, we do whatever we want. We got grace. I'm under the grace of God. No fear of the Lord. But those that can be restrained by God, the fear of the Lord's on your life. When you have the fear of the Lord, you have the favor of God. <laughs> the favor of God, everything's there. He moves mountains for you. Things can be released to you. Why? Because you're loyal to him. Loyalty. Samson was not loyal. Okay? He had some issues. He had some weaknesses. So Samson had a weakness in morality. We know that. So the restraint principle was connected to his hair. And so not, not, did God not just tell him what his restraint was, what he was to do? Okay, but in God's great mercy, he said, don't cut your hair. This is a reminder, Samson, that I, that you, I own you. Come on now. This is a reminder, Samson, that you are mine. That I've called you for this purpose to deliver the people. You're called to be a great deliverer. I need you, Samson to follow my restraint so I can use you in a way that no man has ever been used before. But can I trust you? Are you loyal to me? Oh boy. But he had a weakness. He liked Philistine women. Come on. We know the story. You can read that. So as a Nazarite, he could never cut his hair. The angel didn't speak. Now this is interesting too. The angel didn't speak of uh, the women, but of his hair and strong drinks. So, you know, you would think God would say, don't have any, you know, don't have any sexual morality. You know, he said, if you keep this covenant is what I believe God is saying. If you keep covenant with me and you yield to the divine restraint, I will keep you from this. But just like you look at Balaam, you look at people in the Bible that had a little mixture going on. A little dabble here, a little dabble there. They didn't last long. It's true. Because they didn't honor the restraint of God. 
call is there. It's true. The call is there. The purpose is there. But the loyalty to God is not most important. Okay. The Bible says that God searches the earth. He looks to and fro to find that someone's heart is loyal to him that he can use. Right now. And I'm, this is not, this is, this is a great, this is grace because we can repent, right? We can repent to God. when We mess up and get back in right alignment. We've all had to do that. But what I want you to see is the seriousness of what God speaks to you concerning your purpose and the call on your life. Okay. So his weakness, but his weakness would be his demise. That which he did not master, mastered him. Okay, so everybody at the sound of my voice, we all have weaknesses and things that we have to pull on the grace and the power of God to overcome. But as we continue to yield to God's restraints and we grow in spiritual authority, those things that trafficked us and trampled us, but when I continue to yield to God, I come over here and, and God, I'm strong now in spirit. Okay? And you learn the tricks and traps of the devil, right? And you can, you can yield to the restraint of God now. And the things that used to tempt you, they don't flatter you no more. They can't pull you anyway. You realize, thank God you understand spiritual warfare. You realize the spirit behind what is speaking to you. All right. And so his weakness would be his demise. Isn't that something that God sends us to deliver? He gives him a sign. Don't cut your hair. This is a promise to you. I'm going to be with you. And you're going to overtake all the enemies of Israel. You're going to walk in such power, such authority that no other man has walked in. I've called you to do great things. Hmm. But don't do this, just like the garden. You can have all of these trees, but this one you don't touch or you will die, right? And so some things God spoke, just like when God spoke to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, when he was jealous over his brother's offering. Hmm. Now, you have to understand that both of those boys grew up knowing the proper offering to give. Come on now. Yeah. It wasn't that Cain didn't know what he was supposed to do because he was taught by his father the right way. Come on now. God didn't, Adam didn't, you know, they didn't say we're just going to uh, teach Abel the right thing, but we're not going to teach Cain how to do right. We know better than that. They were, they were raised up to know how to give an offering to God. But one chose the right way, and the other one chose fleshly things. Okay? It was, you know, say, well, man, he gave the best of his fruit and all that, you know, the best of his garden. But that wasn't what was required of him. Okay? It's pretty easy to go pick some, pick some radishes and throw it on the altar. But to have to go out and slay an animal and, yeah, slay an animal and, uh, bloody you know what I'm saying that's a lot of work had to go out he, he knew how to do an offering that was pleasing to God but he did not give God his best he gave him it was careless it was kind of like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal after which Esau went and cried and cried. He sought it with tears, but could not get it back. Why? Because Esau's tears were, was worldly regret. Man, I, oh, I'm not going to get that money. I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to get my inheritance. It wasn't about, I just hurt God's heart. You understand? There wasn't a repentance to change. That's what we're missing in the church, the fear of God. Now, Peter's, Peter's uh, crying out and his tears was different, okay? Because when Peter uh, betrayed Jesus those three times, when Peter went and wept bitterly too, uh-huh. But Peter, Jesus said, look, I've prayed for you. Your faith failed not. 
And when you're converted, straighten your brother. So God knew Peter's heart. Peter had issues in his flesh. He had ideas. He had things that God had to strip out of him. But Peter had an authentic love for Jesus. Come on now. But Esau, he sold it for a piece, for a pot of soup, you know, for a bowl of soup. Fleshly appetites. See, so what's important to us? Yeah. So Genesis 4, 7. See, God spoke to Cain. Now, for God to say, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? So God knew he knew better. You understand that? God knew he knew what to do, but he did not do it. He said, if you do well. He says, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. He said, but you must master this. You must master it. So, so we have the ability to yield to God or that other flesh man. We have it. We have this will that God gave us and he loves us to surrender it to him. So there is a lifestyle of holiness before the Lord that will protect the restraining order in your life. Now, I don't know about you, but when I say something and I know the Holy Spirit doesn't like it, it's not even like I'm out cussing a bunch of words, okay? I'm just saying anything. I know when I release something and the Holy Spirit doesn't like it. Oh. And I'll be like, Father, forgive me right now. Even if I'm talking to somebody, ah, I shouldn't have said that, you know, and it's not, and it's not even like some people say, well, that ain't no big deal. What you said, it is a big deal to God <laughs> because when you carry authority, you got to be restrained. You got to be restrained. You remember when apostle Paul was talking to the Corinthian church, he said, would you rather me come with a whip? He said, or with gentleness, because he knew he had authority and he could come with a whip. Come on now. He could have done some damage to those people because he carried authority. But he chose what? Gentleness, kindness, mercy. You understand? And so if you're going to be used by God, especially you're talking about, you know, fivefold government gifts, you got to be restrained by God. Okay, so in Judges 16, 4 through 6, the spirit of Delilah. So Delilah, in that chapter, you can write that down. Um, Delilah, that spirit of Delilah wanted the secret, and it wants the secrets of your anointing. So we know that's a type and shadow of seducing spirit. Come on, uh, trying to steal. Let's go to 16. Your authority, okay, your strength. 4 6 says after this it came about that that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah the lord of the Philistine came up to her and said to her entice him and see where his great strength lies and how we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him he said then we will each of each give you 1100 pieces of silver and so here Delilah says to Samson, please tell me where your great strength is and how you may be bound to afflict you. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh cords and have not been dried and I will become weak and be like every, like any other man. Then six says, and the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh cords that had been dried and she bound him with them. And now he says, now she had men lying in wait in the inner room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as a string of toes snaps when it touches fire. So his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah says to him again, behold, you have deceived me and told me lies. Now, please tell me how you may bound. Now, she's been lying to him the whole time. He loved this woman, but she sure didn't love him. So she was an assignment. So sometimes the enemy sends people through our path as an assignment against us to steal the strength, to get us to break restraint, right? Temptation, things like that come our way, but it's up to us to identify these things. 
And you will know because we know how fam even familiar spirits, how they work, right? So we know that the enticing and the temptation that pulls on my flesh is not God. I don't care what package it comes in. I don't care who it is. If it's pulling on your flesh in a negative area, in a place of weakness, probing a place of weakness to get you to break restraint. It is a spirit that's operating, trying to steal that. And so Ephesians, no, we know that give no place to the devil. So that Delilah spirit will want to the secret to your anointing. This restraining principle was still there. Though Samson played with the enemy. It was still there all these times that she kept coming and he kept, they were lying, you know, cat and mouse game, whatever, kept doing that. And he had his strength until he finally wore out. He was tempted and he sinned. Okay. And it's interesting. If we go back, the angel didn't say, he didn't speak about, and I'm not condoning that, but the, if he would have kept his hair, his covenant, his restraint in place, I believe he would have, he would have never fell into that, but it was first in his heart. You understand? It was like, it was like when Judas had a thought in his heart to betray Jesus, right? Satan put the thought in Judas's heart to betray Jesus in John 12. And then, and then Jesus is washing feet. He's doing all of that calling Judas friend, you know, kissing him, all of this trying to, you know, Judas was not, uh, he did not keep the restraint. He didn't release that. He could have, I believe people have whatever thought, but when Jesus is, you know, washing his feet and calling out to him, you know, but he didn't listen. He didn't listen. And so it says after Jesus handed the bread and the wine, to Judas because Jesus is now grieved because it's going to happen. This man's done it. He's done cross bounties. I've tried to, I've done all this and Judas is not listening. He wasn't listening to Jesus. And so he wasn't listening. And so then he ends up when he takes it, then Satan enters in the door of that covetousness. You understand what I'm saying? Like there was a door that was open. The thought was there. Judas never dealt with his thought life. That's how important it is to deal with our thoughts. Deal with your own mind. How, how do I do in the mind of Christ? Get in the word. Cast down these vain imaginations. You know the things that pull on your flesh. You know it's different for everyone. But it's up to you to master that thing. Okay, we can, we do deliverance, absolutely, and we do that, but there are some things that you must master yourself. It's true. You can get in every deliverance line you want. It just depends on the call and what God's called you to do. There's some things you got to master yourself, and God's not going to cast that out of you. He's going to say, okay, you're going to learn some principles right here. Can you be restrained? Can he restrain you? Okay. And so, but Judas did it. And we know what happened. Satan entered him now. But the, but the entrance to Judas was the covetousness in his heart that he did not deal with. All right. So see what I'm saying? It can do different for everyone. And so the word of God was issued by the court of heaven decree over Samson. When an angel of the Lord comes or a prophet speaks over you, a real prophet speaks to you, God speaks to you, it has been issued to you. You understand? It has been released to you. So that came out of heaven to him. And it was a decree with uh, stipulation upon uh, him being a judge. Okay? God, God put him in his mother's womb. He made covenant with mama and with the baby and all of that. That was a decree that was issued out of heaven. So I'm here to tell you there are the same uh, decrees, different things that God has written. God has spoke to your, your assignment in the earth. Who you are in Christ has been issued by the Father because he created you. He created you. So he put within us 
inside of the call of God on our life, whatever it is, whatever God has called you to do, the gifts of calling on your life. When you were in your mother's womb, we know he wove us together. Bible says Psalm 31, 139, he, he wove us together. He knitted us together. The knitting of God, of Abba, he knitted us together means that he, he was writing this love poem about us. It's so awesome. There was poetry, love poetry about your life. But in the midst of the tapestry and the poetry is restraints. And many of us, like myself, broke them many times. But I'm telling you, your assignment, you have, you have restraints. Because there's great authority that some are called to walk in. So you have to, you have to walk this out with the Lord. That's why you have to deal with those little foxes. You got to deal with your insecurity. Come on now. You got to deal with your fear. You got to deal with, you know, when um, in Corinthians and he was talking about, you know, some of you, you know, you have this competition, you get jealous, you get envy, you have all that. He says, you're, you're carnal you're still yet. He said, I can't give you anything because you're not yet ready. He said, I can't give you meat because you still need milk. He says, but if you keep drinking the milk of the word, you're going to grow some teeth. <laughs> you're going to grow teeth and you're going to be able to chew some meat, right? So you don't just step out because you still need some milk in some areas. That's what people do. They want to go from zero to a hundred in, you know, I should be further along. I should be here. Well, if you're not, there's a, per there's a reason for it, right? But the grace of God is with you. Okay. Stay in the race. Amen. Stay in the race because he's working out some good things for you. So because this word was issued by the court of heaven, decree was made over this man's life, this child's life as a judge. Heaven was also watching to see if he would stay true to the restraint of God or not. I think we sometimes don't understand just how powerful we are that the host of heaven is with you, that the host of heaven is watching to see. Are they going to restrain here? Can you see the angels talking, having conversations when a temptation comes, when God calls you to do something? Because the angels work with us. They aid us, right? So some angels are busy. Praise God. And then there's some angels that are bored. <laughs> You're preaching heresy. No, I believe it. <laughs> I believe there are some angels that want to be dispatched. But they need some authority to work with in the earth. They want to do these things. Come on now. I know it's true. And so... So the nagging of the spirit wore him down. His addiction to the Philistine women cost him greatly. Okay. It wore him down. That's what happens when we don't deal with that nagging thing. <laughs> whatever that nagging thing is, whatever that lie is that keeps talking, if we don't deal with it and we don't master it and learn to take our authority over it, it's going to wear us down. Mm-hmm. That argument that you have against the call of God on your life. Oh, meddling. <laughs> Sometimes there's an argument. It's true. Sometimes there, it's that fear, that argument all the time, like back and forth. And, you know, uh, fear of failure, not good enough, not smart enough. There's always going to be an argument when God tells you to do something. And it never stops, does it? Mm -hmm. You got to cast it down at every level that God takes. You got to cast it down. James 1 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And so what is that nagging argument, that nagging temptation? Some people, and I heard this, it's going to cost me too much. I just heard that. It's too much. Just want a little bit. 
I don't want to be all in. Just let me be on the bank. Let me just have my ankles ankle deep. Ankle deep is enough. You're missing your destiny. It's true. Ankle deep is not enough. Because in the river of God, when the angel took him ankle, waist, remember he kept going up and then finally he had, he had to swim. And when he was swimming, it was then that he could see what was on the bank. Remember? He asked him, what do you, you see? You, you know, he saw. He saw the healing. He saw the leaves. He saw the trees. He saw all kinds of things. But the vision that God had for him, the prophet couldn't see it until he was fully submerged. But some people don't want to go all the way in. And it will cost you. But when you say yes to God, then the grace is released. That's what I try and tell people. The yes gives you grace. Stubbornness does not give you the grace, okay? But yes does. And so all that God uses mightily in authority has restraints. God cannot use one fully unless he can be restrained. And so in Galatians 5, the fruit of self-control self must be evident in our life, okay? That can be your attitudes toward your peers. That's the biggest thing because... You know, uh, you heard, I think Pastor Becky was talking about, you know, mission fields, we love them. But what about our home field? Right? People want to go do the mission field, and we do that, and we want people to go. But we also want people to understand their home front, their assignment here. Come on. And so the fruit of self-control must be evident in your life. I'm almost finished. The fruits of the Spirit operate when we are yielded to what? The Holy Spirit. And so if we don't come up under God's restraint, you can't be elevated in authority. Because what happens is you will, you will begin to walk in the works of the flesh or control. You'll begin to walk in domination. You'll begin to walk in... In really, which we know, control, domination, manipulation, intimidation, all that's evil, right? That's the spirit of witchcraft. So sometimes people desire authority so much, but God has not delegated them, them that authority because they have no restraint, but they still use it anyway. I knew a man, he was saved, but he had, and it's illegal, and it abuses and hurts people, Okay. I know a man that had such, he was called to walk in great authority. Okay. I know him very personal. He was called to walk in that, but he was never surrendered fully to God's authority. He had a lot of sin natures. He had a lot of, he needed deliverance. He had anger issues. He had unforgiveness. He had, he had a lot of uh, religion, a lot of critical thinking, all of that. But I could see in his life that people in the world were even afraid of him. He could walk on his he could walk on his job, and people knew he was a religious man, okay, without love, but he was very religious. And so he could even walk on the job and everybody on the job would just kind of come up, be afraid of this person and Everything in his, every, he could go into the store and people would be like, oh, you know. And they were afraid of him. And God began to show me some things about that. That this person was called to walk in high levels of authority in the kingdom of God. But because in his soul, there was many places that were unredeemed. There was things in him that needed to be dealt with, but he never dealt with them. He didn't have the revelation of these things. And so the devil used him in illegitimate or illegal authority to operate in a wrong spirit. So he was operating in control. He was operating in witchcraft, not knowing it, manipulating, dominating, all kinds of things, harsh, right? But if he could have just crossed over, the power he could have walked in. Because think about it, this authority that he walked in, this power, this other spirit actually that he walked in, it affected everything around his life in a negative way. But what if he would have got 
delivered. What if he would have got set free? Wow. Demons would have been trembling. You know what I'm saying? Because he was called to great authority, but he couldn't master some things. He was locked in his past. He was locked in a lot of traumas, a lot of things in his life that he never got healed with. So I think about people out in the world and people that are not yet born again or not delivered and they're, they're operating in that other spirit. But I'm telling you, spiritually, many of them, if you can flip that and see it spiritually, they're called, they're called to do great things in the kingdom, but that's been unredeemed right now. That's why we pray for people to, to get it, amen, to get born again. And so uh, he showed me a lot about that. And I really began to understand some things. And so restraints come from the courts of heaven. And I'm going to close there because I won't finish. But restraints come from the courts of heaven. Satan knows when you break them. All right. He has legal entrance to attack you. The goal is to destroy or to steal your purpose. Because some people think, oh, it's a given. I'm going to walk in my purpose. Really? We pray we do. <laughs> we pray we do that we hear God. So the enemy knew Samson was exposed and guilty, but he was deceived because pride is a blinding spirit. And you remember he said after he gave up his secret, right? He despised his covenant. He tells the enemy, this is what it really is. He, he was, it, it nagged him to death. And he finally gave in and the wages of sin is death, right? So he yielded to that. They come in, they do what they do. They gouge out his eyes, put him in prison, all of that. So he lost his vision. He lost the vision of the Lord his purpose, every, his, everything was stolen from him, and he died right there. Mm -hmm. But then his hair starts growing. Praise God for mercy, right? So we love the love of God. His hair grew back, and he did all that. But I don't believe it was God's best plan that he died like that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe if he would have walked out and had the restraint... And he would have honored God and he would have took his calling serious, like very serious. This is a serious call because Samson, your call is to save the children of Israel. Your call is to bring people out of captivity. It's very important because unless you obey me, unless you, you keep this restraint on your life, they will overtake my people it's important because your calls about others your gifts are about others they're not for you your gift is not for you mm -hmm. the gift is for others the call of god is for souls in whatever area that he's calling you uh to work and to serve in and so one thing about him he gets up i shake myself like every other time pride god's like Phew. You despise your you despise your restraint. You disobeyed me. And all of heaven knew it. Can you imagine? It's like, wow, that's something, isn't it? So we need to ask the Lord in closing. You need to just, you know, let that word sink in and just meditate on that. Because the enemy will send people to you to steal your strength. And sometimes people haven't gotten over family stuff. Family is probably number one, really, yourself and then your family and all that, all those others. But and it's not that you don't love people, but you have to learn to separate the people from the spirit. Right. And you pray for those and you and you do all that. But you can't your identity as a child of God is just that it's a child of God. So sometimes you have to walk in lowly places in the restraint of God. Sometimes God will cut people out of your life if you let him. Doesn't mean you don't love them, but sometimes you have to. Sometimes you walk alone. You know, sometimes the circle of friends gets smaller and smaller, right? Sometimes you go through persecution. Sometimes people will speak evil of you. You'll be betrayed. Everything Jesus said would happen will happen. <laughs> 
just like he said it, but there's grace. And it's so much better to know that you kept the restraint through all the hell you went through. You kept it, right? And if you haven't kept it, it's awesome to know that you've been forgiven. Praise God. So let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray over you corporately. And if anybody that's listening has never received Christ, that's the greatest miracle you will ever have is Jesus. And so the Bible says you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that he died on a cross for us, that he rose again. You can be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. You shall be delivered. You shall be healed, rescued out of darkness. Amen. And to the light. So wherever you're at, if you're listening, you have never received Christ. Today is the day of salvation. You can receive him by faith and accept this beautiful gift of love for you, eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you. Father God, for each and every one that is listened, Father God, we thank you, Father, that you began to show us places of weakness where the enemy pulls on us, Father God. Whatever place that is, whoever he uses, Father God, I just thank you that the power of the Holy Spirit is available, that he is upon us and he can restrain us in these times when we're going through, Father. We will not be offended. We choose not to be offended, we choose to forgive. We choose to love. We choose, Father God, to accept who you created us to be. We choose to say yes to you, Father God. We choose to come out of these things that you have been calling us to master, Father, to walk away from those things, Father, in the name of Jesus. Whatever that restraint is, Father God, I thank you that even now that you're showing the people, some of you might have seen gifts and maybe you have prophetic gifts and God may try be trying to uh, restrain you from watching certain movies and, and shows and he may put a restraint on. You can't watch that. Come on now. Some of you, you know, you may have people that have been stealing your strength that maybe old friends or old relationships that's been speaking in your ear gate some things. And then after you speak to them, you notice that like your imagination and your mind's going in an opposite direction that it does not need to go. You need to release that. <laughs> Some of you have been arguing with God about the call of God on your life. You need to settle it. You need to settle it. Some of you struggle with identity issues. You need to settle it. You're a child of God, period. We thank you, Father, for the grace. We thank you for the grace right now in the name of Jesus. We give you glory. We give you honor right now in Jesus' name. So this word needs to sink into you. Yeah, you can cut it. It needs to sink in. Mm -hmm. 